uh, thank you for coming uh, and I'm introducing Charles Ledbetter. Uh, he is a chair in Transgender Studies Fellowship recipient, a uh, writer, an activist, and a PhD candidate at the University of Turbingen in Germany. Uh, he's a graduate of Orange County Foster Care System. Charles received a BA in English Literature from UCLA and an MPhil from the University of Cambridge. Their doctoral dissertation analyzes the intersection of trans and post-human themes in contemporary speculative fiction. This fellowship at the University of Victoria's Transgender Archives and the Chair of Transgender Studies grants them the opportunity to study written text by trans folks, for trans folks, and the liberatory imaginaries therein. Please join me in welcoming Charles Lippert. As the title suggests, or says outright, um, today I'll be talking about trans speculative fiction in independent media. This is part of my doctoral dissertation on the intersection of trans and posthumanism, which is important for how trans posit modes of being other than docile consumers, but more on that when I hand in in 2020. Uh, because this research relies on material history, my archival research has generously been sponsored, sponsored by the Chair in Transgender Studies. Thank you. So, what is speculative fiction? It seems like a lot of you already know, but a bit of theoretical history. Uh, speculative fiction is an umbrella genre encompassing science fiction, fantasy, magical realism, etc., etc. Um, it's a postmodern term that came about through a challenge to the boundaries between various genre fictions, and generally repositions these texts not as a set of tropes and conventions, but as a challenge to hegemonic post-enlightenment epistemology, or what is called reality. Uh, speculative fiction is marginal within the study of literature because we still haven't quite gotten over the romantic and masculinist idea of the genius of the vind individual author. The perceived conventionality of genre fiction is therefore considered low culture. More on this from Bourdieu. Then again, it's not like Elizabethan sonnets weren't conventional to the point of standardized inflections, and Romeo and Juliet wasn't an AU fanfic of Pyramus and Thisbe, but we don't talk about that. Um, speculative, more on that. Speculative fiction is important for trans studies because, as I'll discuss later, it's one of the more prevalent genres for trans themes in literature, second perhaps to biography. Thematically, it also challenges the dominant medicalized epistemology of transness that persists even to this day. So what is independent media? Rather than a genre, independent media denotes modes of publication, so anything which falls outside the scope of mass distributed literature. I'm deliberately avoiding the word mainstream because it normativizes the content of corporate publishing as, well, mainstream. So why study independent media? By and large, mass, distrib mass distributed speculative fiction, which foregrounds gender alterity, is written by cisgender authors and often propagates cissexist views, as the first half of my presentation discusses. I'm looking at independent media because I'm curious as to whether fewer, fewer publication barriers produce narratives with more nuanced and resonant representations of trans experiences, and if so, what do these representations look like? There is some question about what constitutes trans literature. Is trans authorship essential? Does it need to be mimetic, as in representing transness in recognizable terms and images? I think these are important, and I also favor the idea of resonance, which is when the content of a text has a more figurative relationship to trans social categories. For example, I've always found vampire fiction resonant with my experiences as a trans person because it deals with non-normative gender embodiment, um, complex relationships with time, age, and history, and reformulations of the erotic body. A lot of research on trans people is social scientific, so there is some question about what literary studies can contribute. I think it's important to study trans literature because it's an imagined space. As such, it provides a window onto the desires and subjective representations of trans people by trans people. And it shows how imagination and fiction are an important part of trans people's experiences and self-exploration, when doing so in real spaces can be a dangerous proposition. <laughs> 
It's also important because it validates trans experiences as authentic and makes space for liberated possibilities. Personally, growing up in a vociferously Republican part of the states, Orange County, well now it's Democrat, eh? Um, it took a referendum on Hitler, but there you go. Um, representations of LGBT plus people um, in media at my time, Willow and Tara and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, gave me insight into myself and a sense of connection to others. Don't be too alarmed, we'll, we'll get through this somehow. Um, and now to the meat of the project. I'm going to dis discuss mass distributed trans speculative fiction and its discursive contexts. This proceeds chronologically but not teleologically, as in it doesn't necessarily get better until quite later. Um, because for the most part, we're talking about a history of appropriation. Uh, rather, I discuss moments and interventions in the field which have shifted trans, page turn, representation and authorship. Um, in the section on independent media, we'll switch gears from a deep dive into one medium into a survey of many different kinds of media. Um, you can think of the relationship between mass and independent media like Kate Bornstein's discussion of non-binary. It's just a matter of locating gender and then just going somewhere else. You locate mass distributed and then you just go somewhere else. Anyway. Um, the first question is where to start the canon, which is an issue inherent in studying a genre. Um, some histories date speculative fiction to 1947 when author Robert Heinlein drew a distinction between it and science fiction. It can also be dated to its first recorded use in an 1889 London literary magazine. Some histories describe speculative fiction more broadly, encompassing ancient narrative works um, which are intended to be paradigm changing in their own context, like Euripides' Medea. Um, so the Hellenistic myth of the prophet Tiresias striking a pair of copulating serpents with a stick and turning into a woman could be counted in the history of trans speculative fiction by this very broad definition. Um, or if we look at the Christian gospels as narrative fiction, the supernatural fi figure of Jesus troubles gender along with other social binaries of their time. I'm not casting this wide of a net, I just think it's an interesting thing to look at. So. Um, I've made the decision to track the canon with the novel, which developed as a literary form in the 18th century and concretized science fiction elements in the early 19th century, particularly with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, along, uh, among other early antecedents. The first surviving instance of gender transformation in English literature was in Thorne Smith's Turnabout in 1882, a comedic story about a husband and wife's consciousness switching bodies. H.P. Lovecraft revisited this as a horror narrative in The Thing on the Doorstep, with a man who is possessed by the consciousness in, of his wife until he is driven to murder her. Lovely. Robert Heinlein, who I've mentioned before, um, used this trope in I Will Fear No Evil, a story of a dying rich man who pays to have his consciousness embedded, embedded in a new young body. This turns out to be the body of his secretary, and her surviving consciousness teaches him how to embody traditional femininity. It is actually quite similar to, trans to the transvestite fantasy fiction that I'll discuss later. A problem with this genre, which I call gender swap, is that it reifies the idea that there are male and female bodies and forms of consciousness. It also casts gender change in a sinister light. This is, this is represented hyperbolically in Roland Puchetti's The Death of the Fuhrer, when the consciousness of Hitler is planted into the body of an attractive young woman. If you wonder from whence comes the trope of trans feminine people as male predators, here's a clue. Um, an outlier in this time period is Virginia Woolf's Orlando, where, if you don't know, a young aristocratic man magically metamorphoses into a woman and experiences centuries of English history. It's a generic outlier because Orlando's gender change is not a switch of bodies or consciousness, but rather there is a change of individual gender identity. It's actually quite progressive for its time if you ignore the opening scene where the dissipated aristocrat Orlando is poking a moor's head with a rapier like a macabre pinata. We can laugh, it's cool. <laughs> um, the discursive framework for these early texts come from early sexology, wherein scientists such as Havelock Ellis describe transgender phenomena as inversion, 
In this, there are male and female forms of consciousness which in some cases find themselves in the wrong body. Though somewhat progressive in its time, this framework was also deeply pathologizing and has remained embedded in contemporary consciousness. Yeah, I see a nod over there. Um, a major intervention in speculative fiction comes with radical feminist critique. This literature questioned the patriarchal status quo and was politically engaged in positing alternatives. Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. I assume a few people here have read this one. Yeah, that was my first sort of window into myself, I suppose. Describes a single gender world wherein people assume male and female secondary sex characteristics only during mating cycles. Le Guin later apologized that this choice locked the society into heterosexuality. Um, in Angela Carter's Passion of the New Eve, Feminist res revolutionaries forcibly transform a young Englishman into a woman in order for him to understand their plight. Though these narratives aim to expose and deconstruct the oppression of women, their appropriations of trans bodies were sexist and sometimes deeply transmisogynistic. Joanna Russ's The Female Man dedicates a whole chapter to transmisogynist polemic. Uh, trigger warning for transmisogynist polemic and also maybe not the best choice of contrasting font colors. Um, but in an alternate universe, women have been erased from male society, replaced by men who have been changed into women, or the changed, also the half-changed, or what we might call feminine men or gay men. There's a collapsing of categories. It's an issue. I love this movie, this like book up until this chapter. Um, Though you can find the antecedents for trans pathologization in early sexology, this particular trans misogynist invective was popularized by Janice Raymond. Oh, I hear groans. The transsexual empire is a polemic against trans people, which ironically uses science fiction images and tropes to prove that trans women are insidious productions of medical patriarchy who are raping women's spaces with their phallic essences. This is not hyperbole. Um, it's also the theoretical foundation for turfness in contemporary science fiction, and unfortunately, one toxic corner in current social discourse. Um, Sandy Stone's riposte, The Empire Strikes Back, how cool is that? Um, refutes Raymond's arguments and discusses trans identities through more postmodern categories. It also forms the basis for the appropriation of trans in subsequent liberation discourses. From the 1970s, Afrofuturist authors began to explore African diasporic experience and deconstructing the white colonialism of science fiction. Samuel Delaney makes an interesting intersectional choice when one of his characters, a frustrated white female math prodigy who is stuck waiting tables in the Midwest, yay deindustrialization and neoliberalism, who decides to undergo medical treatments to become a pansexual black man. He then writes his own job description as a high-ranking civil servant. So I suppose that was successful in that universe. Um, Octavia Butler's Lilith's Brood is set on a post-apocalyptic Earth where surviving humans must interbreed with an alien species with three genders, male, female, and uloi. I'm personally compelled by her topical representation of non-binary genders, but it is also a bit othering to have one's selfhood represented ambivalently as sexually enthralling but viscerally repulsive. Oops. In the early noughties, as I like to call them, the, <laughs> the fiction begins to diversify we begin to see more genres represented, including Mary Gentle's fantasy series, Ilario. There are also more non-hegemonic perspectives, such as Daniel Heath Justice's uh, speculative fiction series, The Way of Thorn and Thunder, indigenous series. Um, authors also begin to represent marginalization and embodiment in ways that are legible for actual trans people, including the identity struggles of trans masculine teenager, Sam, in Anna Marie McLemore's When the Moon Was Ours. Still, you have the limitation that authors are primarily cisgender and producing problematic representations. In The Way of Thorn and Thunder, the non-cisgender minor character Fa Alik is represented as a hybrid of traditional masculinity and femininity and is unproblematically sage and heroic. 
um, moving between the blood of war and the blood of the moon without fear, something like the noble savage trope. It's not until the 2010s that we get mass distributed fiction from fan authors, um, from trans authors, fan authors later. Um, Caitlin R. Kiernan's The Drowning Girl is a horror magical realization novel whose narrative tries to hold together a relationship with a trans feminine girlfriend while coping with the onset of hereditary mental illness. G. Yang's The Red Threads of Fortune creates a fantasy world in which children are not assigned genders at birth and instead decide on them later in life, or not at all. There are also a wide variety of possible gendered embodiments and categories. April Daniel's Dreadnought is about a trans feminine person who inha inherits the powers of a dying superhero. While you'd think this would be a shallow empowerment narrative, the, no the novel also has nuanced descriptions about the lingering trauma of transphobia and why it's therefore important to take care of oneself and set strong boundaries. With the shift to trans authorship, authors are able to engage with more nuances of trans experience. With the diversification of literature by cisgender authors, there's an impulse to represent trans people as unproblematically good, especially because there are some deeply transphobic attitudes embedded in our culture. However, when the darker and more difficult elements of trans experience are erased from the narrative, the literature struggles to represent the affect of trans oppression and the politically relevant actions that come from it. Susan Stryker's My Words to Victor Frankenstein, um, Performing Transgender Rage, discusses the political utility of rage in transgender, and in transgender advocacy and activism. Though we forego the privilege of naturalness, we are not deterred, for we ally ourselves instead with the chaos and blackness from which nature itself spills forth. This is the moment, I would argue, in which we're finding trans-authored speculative fiction is being able to embody these kinds of affect. Now that we've come to the present moment in trans-speculative fiction, I'm going to shift to the independent media. My archive for independent um, fiction begins in the 1990s, not because this is when trans people began to independently produce speculative fiction, but rather because this is the extent of the material archive that I've been able to locate so far. Raises questions about what survives history. But anyway, um, the first genre, the first medium rather, I'd like to discuss is transvestite fantasy fiction. Uh, the earliest examples I found in the archive date from the 1980s, and at first I thought, oh, fantasy fiction, excellent! I then realized that this wasn't medieval chivalry and mythopoesis, but fantasy here denotes the act of fantasizing by the author. These, are in, these were independently published in zine format and circulated by mail order. Some of them have disclaimers in the front cover saying that they do not condone the, mirror, the material in the pages, most likely to avoid the obscenity laws which were targeting gay publications in the United States. Generically, these stories tend to feature cisgender men who are forced to become women. In the same boxes in which I found forced feminization erotica, I found a lot of transvestite fem um, fantasy lit, so there's something of a spectrum. Most of these stories are realist in their wor world building, but some incorporate supernatural and science fiction elements. For example, in one story, Dare Stormtroopers, it's not what you think. <laughs> Two post-gender cyber cadets attempt to liberate oppressed trans people on other worlds. I hear echoes of Sandy Stone in this text. While the tone of this story is playful, there is ambivalence about fantasy in the genre generally. Oh, that's difficult to read. Well, they want to end all suffering of trans people, is the point. Um, in one poem, Reality, by Christine Kingsley, the speaker, somewhat vulnerably, discloses the hope that the act of fantasizing will manifest their desired female embodiment without external judgment. This points to a function of trans speculative fiction generally, which is a space in which trans people can explore their selfhoods without fear of reprisal. Though, of course, this gesture simultaneously exposes the existential grief of dysphoria and oppression. Another publication medium is small press. These share some of the features of mass distribution, including material printing and editorial oversight, except on a smaller scale 
and often with a particular thematic or ideological orientation. For example, Topside Press, which published Imogen Binney's Nevada, which maybe some of you have read, if I do, it's great, um, is dedicated to trans fiction by trans authors. Some small presses publish anthologies, such as the recent trans Transcendent Speculative Fiction anthologies. The earliest example of trans speculative fiction by a trans author I was able to discover in the archive was Kate Bornstein's Nearly Roadkill, an Infobon erotic adventure. Published in 1996, the story is about two characters who meet in cyberspace, inhabiting a range of genders and identities. This explores the trans possibilities of cyberspace in which individuals could inhabit different social worlds without perceived dissonances in embodiment. In addition to creating opportunities for gendered self-exploration and community, the internet has multiplied the possibilities for independent media. Transvestite fantasy fiction continues on platforms such as Amazon and Wattpad, including the only example I could find of, tra of a trans vampire novel, until I write one. <laughs> These platforms also provide opportunities for other authors, including trans masculine people who are still vastly underrepresented in mass distributed literature. While zines have been an important part of urban trans publishing history, often produced in specific communities with links to punk and anarchist culture, the internet has offered opportunities for wider exposure. For example, Transvengers, a webzine now curated by the Welcome Collection in London, features trans protagonists meeting early thinkers in trans theorizing. For example, Havelock Ellis, who I mentioned, who formalized the inversion hypothesis. So next up is Hav Havelock Ellis. Tell us more about your theory of inversion. For instance, that a lesbian has the soul of a man in the body of a woman. I just wanted a way to explain homosexuality and trans so that the general public would understand. I said people were born in the wrong body, but I didn't really believe that. I think of it kind of like colorblindness, a natural variation in human beings that doesn't need curing or fixing. Anyway, I'm glad you brought me to 2014 when this was written. I've been really wanting to see Lady Gaga in concert. Do you know the song Born This Way? My ideas live on. The internet has also given space for trans people to reflect on mass culture, particularly in fan fiction. This story, The White Knight Riots, set against the backdrop of the Harvey Milk Riots in 1970 San Francisco, shows a domestic portrait of a transmasculine Peter Pan in an emotionally abusive relationship with banker James Hook. The story transes J.M. Barrie's novel by viewing Pan's age-queer masculinity as transmasculine, while simultaneously exploring trans homoerotic possibilities. It also discusses topical subject matter for trans people. Considering that up to 50% of trans people experience intimate partner violence in their lifetimes, the story acts as a space to acknowledge and validate routinely erased aspects of trans experience. Um, am I giving enough time to read while I speak or shall I read at the same time? Okay, fantastic. Some media combine formats. Um, one of the most compelling narratives I've come across in this re research is Storm Constantine's Raytheu, um, which I discussed at this year's Moving Trans History Forward conference. It's a near-future post-apocalyptic series where Raytheu, who are a non-binary evolutionary offshoot of humanity, attempt to build up a society without gender hierarchies. They also solve international conflicts using sex magic. It's what I call Charles fantasy fiction. Though it was originally published by a mass publisher in the late 1980s, when the, series, when the series wasn't renewed, the author published later novels through her independent press. Recently, she also began creating anthologies with fan fiction authors, which is amazing. Um, Raytheu is particularly interesting because it has moved between mass and independent media and has found creative ways of combining different formats. This is one possible future for independent media, where there is greater exchange between the mass market and independently published text, and where there is greater exchange between the formats which have proliferated since the advent of the internet. So, a few takeaways. So this is just a flavor of the many, many, many indie platforms out there, but there are already some important takeaways from them. 
there is more trans authorship and there are more texts with overtly political content, I would say. Sometimes the content is also quite problematic, but the point isn't to judge the literature on a sliding scale of acceptable representation or not. Rather, it's important to understand the complex relationship between desire and text, and perhaps generally to view speculative fiction through the lens of desire. Because, you know, it's not like Heinlein wasn't expressing certain kinds of patriarchal and misogynistic desires in his literature. So why can't we express what we want through literature without that being considered low culture? Um, finally, it's important to think about the material conditions of trans speculative fiction, which can be glimpsed in perhaps the most independent of indie media, private scribblings and raw feeling. Um, there are two files in the Reed Erickson collection titled Art and Ravings, not his title, but Aaron and the other people who organized the um, texts. Most of these are written on hotel stationery and scraps of paper and reveal alternating states of spiritual exaltation and deep inchoate rage. Um, if you can't read the writing, it's an ashram, as they say, where we would stay for months or years in quiet retreat from the main beast true love brought the love bribe vibration into sway. Um, and then this one, I don't know whether you can tell, it's on a paper bag and it complains about there once was an old bag or maybe she should be called a hag. He was very angry about a couple of marriage breakups. And probably just having a difficult life as a trans person, I imagine. Um, it makes me think about all of the trans people who want to write and publish but due to social and economic oppression, don't manage to either put their work out there or even find the space to write and to create. Um, which leads me to the final takeaway of the presentation, that the study of trans literature is inextricable from social and economic justice. It's important to acknowledge that there are major barriers to trans pub publishing, and the novels which are published are only those which pass corporate muster. This means that to responsibly study translit, it is important to consult independent sources and, in a wider sense, it's vital to dismantle the systems which oppress us and produce a society where trans folk can make art. Or heck, it's Transgender Re Day of Remembrance so that we can live and then hopefully have good lives. Thank you. Chair of Transgender Studies again, Aaron DeVore and Michael Rodmacher and my super and my supervisor Ingrid Hotz Davies and all y'all folks with an X for coming. Thank you.